There is a handout that has been uh, supplied in the Slack channel under the Sunday School Lesson channel. So please go there and pull that up or print it out for this morning. Also, if you have any questions, uh, we're probably going to set aside a channel in the future that's for questions. But for today, let's use the general communication channel. Robinson will be checking it for any Sunday school questions and raise his hand on your behalf, and then I'll answer them, hopefully. So let's... Uh, remind ourselves where we are. Uh, right now, our church in general is laboring to grow in its doctrine of God, theology proper. And with the Sunday school lessons, we're focusing on the glory of God. Noel just finished going through uh, a review of the glory of God in the Old Testament, and now we're beginning in the New Testament. And, of course, to begin with, in the New Testament, you have Matthew, Mark, and Luke, the synoptic gospels, optical, opt, they saw, witnesses, and sin together. So those three together have many parallels because they saw, witnessed the works of Christ, whereas John wrote later and focused on different things. So we're focusing on Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John and the glory of God there. And to remind you of part one, today's part two of that, last week there was an emphasis on the importance of Jesus Christ in our study. I introduced that. He is the testimony of Scripture. He said, it is these, that is the Scripture, that testify of me in John five thirty nine. And his unique place as God's agent of special revelation, being the one to declare him, considering his person and relation to the Father, John 1, 18, which is one of the memory verses, says, No one has seen God at any time. The only begotten Son who is in the bosom of the Father, he has declared him. And I mentioned that Uh, One perspective of a broad overview of special revelation is to uh, notice and pay attention to how much of the Old Testament prior to the actual coming of Christ points to him. And then when he comes, there's four accounts of it. And then after he ascends, there's much written about what he actually accomplished and what that means for the future. So uh, it's kind of like word, act, word about that act. And, and where we are now is in that key area of the, the life of the Messiah and his humiliation. And since he is the one who declares the Father, we ought to pay very close attention to the words and life of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, in our study of the glory of God. Uh, Having said that, though, I informed you of some of the obvious limitations of our efforts. Uh, We're only really looking at one word, doxa, which is translated glory most of the time, and and, and some key events in Christ's life. None of this should be thought of as exhaustive. Uh, For example, we could look at the works and signs of Jesus to gain much knowledge of the glory of God. We could look at the words and all the ways in which he spoke, parables, uh, the way he lived and acted, his obedience to the Father. All those things could reveal to us the glory of God, but we're not focusing on those specifically. And then last week, um, the two events, the events that we looked, the things that we looked at was doxa, a usage of that word, and then the birth of Jesus, and then we tied it up at the end there with a discussion about the incarnation. So, moving on this morning, let's go to the transfiguration and the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, and there's some handouts here if, you, if anybody wants any that are on the chairs over there. So, I am moving to point three on your notes. And if you look at the first bullet point, Moses and Elijah, 
It's the reference is Luke 9, 31. And then I have also Matthew and Mark. That's just to give us more biblical content on the Luke 9, 31 passage. The Luke 9, 31 passage is our focus because that's where the word doxa is used. So before I read 931 in isolation, let's just read that whole context. So if you would turn to Luke 9. And I am going to read from 18 to 36. It's a long section for what we're normally used to quoting, but I think it's very important. And it happened as he was alone praying that his disciples joined him and he asked them saying, who do the crowd say that I am? So they answered and said, John the Baptist, but some say Elijah, and others say that one of the prophets has risen again. He said to them, but who do you say that I am? Peter answered and said, the Christ of God. And he strictly warned and commanded them to tell this to no one, saying, the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, chief priests, and scribes, and be killed, and be raised the third day. Then he said to them all, If anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross daily, and follow me. For whoever desires to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake will save it. For what profit is it to a man if he gains the whole world and is himself destroyed or lost? For whoever is ashamed of me and my words of him, the Son of Man, will be ashamed when he comes in his own glory, in his Father's and of the holy angels. But I tell you truly, there is some standing here who shall not taste death till they see the kingdom of God. Now it came to pass about eight days after these sayings that he took Peter, John, and James and went up on, on the mountain to pray. As he prayed, the appearance of his face was altered, and his robe became white and glistening. And behold, two men talked with him, who were Moses and Elijah, who appeared in glory and spoke of his decease, which he was about to accomplish at Jerusalem. But Peter and those with him were heavy with sleep, and when they were fully awake, they saw his glory. And the two men stood with him, then it happened as they were parting from him that Peter said to Jesus, Master, it is good for us to be here and let us make three tabernacles, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah, not knowing what he said. While he was saying this, a cloud came and overshadowed them, and they were fearful as they entered the cloud, and a voice came out of the cloud saying, This is my beloved son, hear him. When the voice had ceased, Jesus was found alone. But they kept quiet and told no one in those days any of the things they had seen. In the ministry of Jesus Christ, approximately three years, he is entering into his final year in a ministry in Perea. Luke records much of that ministry. The Jews had not long rejected him in Galilee after feeding them. And he is in a stage of his ministry where there's a lot of opposition. And it's going to climax in the cross. And if you look at Matthew 17, verse 3 to get context... Or wait, that, that, that's for the specifically Moses. But if you go up, I want to go before that to 1621. From that time, Jesus began. So at a point in Jesus' ministry when he knew and set his face like flint to the cross that this is going to that climax and the opposition is going to ramp he begins to prophesy and tell them of the sufferings that are coming. And he began to show his disciples that they must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things. And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But Jesus said, get behind me, Satan. You are an offense to me. You are not mindful of the things of God. That's what 
the con- that's why I read that context and then went there because remember the disciples, they don't have the clarity of, in, uh, of revelation that we have. They have the Old Testament and what they had been taught from their, their culture and rabbis teaching them and now what Jesus has c- corrected and, and purged out of them and they're growing. <laughs> uh, but they have no idea the hatred that man has against God that's going to be manifest in the sufferings of Christ. And it's going to be directed at them as well to some degree, but of course they'll scatter. And uh, one of, I think that helps, that context helps us get a better understanding of why the transfiguration occurred when it occurred. Um, it's it's uh, a uh, the ministry of the discipleship of Jesus Christ. He got done telling them, if anyone comes after me and does not hate, and, and that's after Peter said, no, you shall not go. And he said, if anyone does not come after me. And, and then knowing their weakness, I believe that in part, God the Father revealed the glory of Jesus Christ to them intimately to better equip them for what was coming. It's kind of like when you're in a storm and you don't know where to go and you need to be reminded there's a lighthouse. Look to the lighthouse, you know. Uh, I heard, I listened to Mark Mudge's sermon on this and Mark, and he was saying it was like uh, uh, a medical student who's laboring to study the body and it's very, very long and arduous uh, degree and in the midst of their studies, they get about three years in and they're tired and they're, they're like, I can't do it, it's too much. And a doctor says, come with me. And he takes them to the hospital and shows them a newborn baby being given to her parents to remind the, 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 the student of the, where you're headed, of the purpose. So the transfiguration helps the disciples and us see where things are going. And it, uh, so let's go. Let's keep going. Um, so he prophesies of his suffering. In unbelief, they seek to rebuke him, but he in turn rebukes them, or Peter particularly, corrects them, and then comes the transfiguration. And if we go back to Mark, Luke 9, And looking at verse 29, as he prayed, the appearance of his face was altered and his robe became white and glistening. And behold, two men were talking with him who were Moses and Elijah, who appeared in glory and spoke of his decease, which was he was about to accomplish in Jerusalem. So let's look first at this word glory as it's related to Moses and Elijah and seek to grow in our understanding of God's glory in that way. And within this area of Moses and Elijah, when it says that they appeared in glory, um, the question is, what does that mean? You know, what does that mean? They appeared in glory. And if you remember last week, there were multiple definitions that glory could take. Uh, It could be the condition of being bright or shining, brightness, splendor, radiance. This is coming from that word doxa and its use in biblical literature. It also could mean a state of being magnificent, greatness or splendor. Uh, It can be honor as enhancement or recognition of status. Or it can be a a transcendent being deserving of honor. And I know that they're not transcendent beings. Uh, And I don't think that this is like they're famous, saying they appeared in fame, like honor. Uh, And I'm not even sure it's a, a state of being magnificent. It's either one or two. 
either they are giving off a form of radiance or and or they are having a form of magnificence or splendor. Uh, and where do they get that? that? That's what we need to get from this is where did Moses and Elijah, when they appear in glory, where does that glory pr come from? It comes from God. Um, it reveals that they had their souls are never dying, that they were translated. Well, Elijah, Moses died, but they're in the intermediate state and perfected spirits yet in some form come down and either through the conversation or just divine uh, communication, the disciples know that's Moses and Elijah. And <clears throat> uh, where did they come from? They came from heaven. It doesn't say that. We just know that that's where uh, those who are in intermediate state reside is to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. So they have come from heaven, sent by the Father, and they are glorious. That goes to tell us that those who are in heaven, even now, have been perfected and are, are, uh, are reflecting God's glory. Uh, it's, I was thinking of that familiar analogy, you know, like the sun and the moon. They cannot help but, but it's like Moses' face when he communicated with, with uh, the, the theophany that God gave in the Old Covenant. He had to cover his face because it shone the glory. Well, they're coming in glory. And that teaches us something about God's glory, that it is majestic, it's transformative. God's glory is transform transformative. All right, uh, let's keep moving, though. Uh, some, some side notes. There is significance with this, you know, uh, Moses being a representative of the law and Elijah being a representative of the prophets and combined they're representative of special revelation, the Old Testament, the then Bible. Uh, and... They should help us see something between the old covenant and the new, the old system and the mediator of the new covenant. The son of God is categorically different and they exist to witness and testify to him. There's not equality. There's not like men getting greater and this is the greatest man. This is testifying of the unique divine Son of God in his mediatorial work. And if you were thinking like the disciples and meditation about that and the way they thought of Moses, Moses was a big deal for Jews and even today uh, to see Moses coming from heaven and speaking to Christ. Uh, would have been helpful to, to help see that, that proportionate difference. This is the Son of God. Um, and what they were speaking of was his exodus. If you look, it says... Um, who appeared in glory and spoke of his decease. And in my side notes, it says death or literally departure. It is literal departure, often meaning as a figure of speech unto this moral, mortal world into death. Um, and it doesn't often get used for the word death. So... Uh, an unusual word for death is used here. And you know what it's transl liter translated or uh, what it reads like? Exodus. The Exodus. The word here is Exodus. 
It's not the normal Greek word for death, though it could be translated to cease. This word is the same Greek word used for Israel's exodus out of Egypt. Given the context of Luke, that is Jesus' prediction of his death, and now his following transfiguration, and the unity of Scripture, this is drawing attention to what Christ came to do as fulfillment of the Old Testament. They're speaking to Christ about his purpose and what he has come to do, the mediator of a better covenant, a new covenant with its own exodus, the true exodus that that Old Testament exodus meant to point to. They're discussing it. And I don't think it missed their attention or even if it did, I don't think I certainly do not think uh, knowing uh, just the way scripture is so unified that regardless of whether the author uh, Luke knew the word he was selecting and why, I know that it ties in perfectly with the revelation given to us. And uh, I, I believe this should serve to remind us that God's glory is, I don't know how to word it, um, greatly manifested, maybe primarily or preeminently in his salvation through judgment. And uh, let's go to the next point. Jesus Christ. So in this transfiguration, in verse 929, his, and he prayed, the appearance of his face was altered and his robe became white and glistening. And also verse 32, they saw his glory. It doesn't list it with the glory of Moses and Elijah appearing, they, they're speaking separately of Jesus saying they saw his glory. He didn't appear in glory like Moses and Elijah. They saw his glory. And specifically, his face was altered or it became different in appearance. Um, metamorpho or metamorpho. Uh, Luke doesn't use that verb, but Mark does. So let's look at the other text, too. I want to show more. First of all, his face, it was altered. It doesn't really say much beyond that. So let's go to Matthew and then Mark, or we'll look at Mark later. Matthew 17. Verse 2. And he was transfigured. So his form, not his essence, his being, his form changed. Um, it's where we get our word metamorphosis. Uh, it's not speaking of his being. It's speaking of his form and it changed. And what happened with his face is it shone like the sun. There, there we have a, a simile. So when I think of the sun, when I look at it, I can't even look at it straight for very long. It blinds me. It, it turns like black and then white and black and, and it's too bright. I just can't take it. When Peter or Peter... James and John, when they, when they give account of this and then it becomes inscripturated, what they said is it's like the sun. And that's his face. He, and that's his face. Let's also look at his robe. While we're here, let's keep going and look at his robe. And his clothes became as white as light. And Mark, remember that, as white as light... In Luke, it said white and glistening. And now let's go to Mark. That's in uh, Mark 9, 2 through 3. His, 
he was transfigured before them. And I want to make a point there. He didn't transfigure himself. It's passive voice. So he was transfigured. He was acted upon by whom? The Father. It is the Father who is revealing his glory and changing his form. Let's keep going, though, to look at his, his uh, glory in these ways. His clothes became shining. So when I think of something that shines, I think of uh, reflection off of water, uh, 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 sun reflecting off things, metals that are polished and they glitter. And exceedingly white like snow. So now his clothes, when they think about whiteness, they think of like pure snow. And it, Mark says, such as no launderer on earth can whiten them. <laughs> it's impossible to achieve what I have seen with my eyes on this planet. <laughs> Um, all that speaks to the transcendent glory of God uh, his majesty and beauty the beauty of his holiness and his nature is infinitude when we think of him in this imagery which is not merely imagery it was reality for their eyes when we're talking about not on this earth, uh, it reminds us of God's transcendent holiness and glory, his greatness. It's beyond us. And yet he's giving us a physical manifestation to help us uh, understand that better. Um, that should teach us some of the glory of God in our study in the synoptics. Um, this is particularly of the sun. And if we go saw his glory, it says there in Luke 9, like the, as I read before, When they saw his glory. So this is his glory. He possesses it. But it's the father that's revealing it. Uh, it should teach us. Not only is God's glory manifest in his essence and nature. But in his triunity. His uh, the father, the son and the spirit. Our God is not, uh, we have a Christian monotheism where we must remember that God is one God in three persons and that each person as we think of them is fully God. So going from there, let's... Uh, I think that that definition, the condition of being bright, shining, brightness, splendor, radiance, would take preeminence when it's describing his glory there. But I know that that, that radiance here being tied to the sun and being manifested by the Father is a result of his ontological glory and his mediatorial glory. So it's not like shining around the angels or the, the glory that Moses and Elijah had that are reflecting merely. This is of the sun in his uh, mediatorial position who is ontologically in the bosom of the Father at all times. God, very God of very God and yet very man of very man manifesting his glory as mediator. Um, so I would say it's probably a combination of one and two for that word doxa, a transcendent being. 
you could combine that one as well, a transcendent being. <laughs> well, well, let's move on, though. Let's go to Luke, the Father in this transfiguration and look at how the Father manifests his own glory and the glory of the Son. In Luke 9, 29, and as he prayed, the appearance of his face was altered. And then the other two translations, Mark and Matthew, transfigured. That Again, that was the passive. Um, I just wanted to remind of that, that this is the Father manifesting the glory of his own Son. And um, let's go to 34 and 35. While he was saying this, so this is Peter speaking about making the tabernacles. While Peter was saying this, a cloud came and overshadowed them. And they were fearful as they entered the cloud and a voice came out of the cloud saying, this is my beloved son, hear him. Look at with me uh, Mark 9. It's a little bit different. Mark gives different details. Verse 7. And a cloud came and overshadowed them. And a voice came saying, This is my beloved son. Uh, another uh, one I, I, I want to say that I was reading, and it might be there in Luke. Or uh, I, I, I skip Matthew. Go to Matthew. That's where I wanted to go. I'm sorry. While he was still speaking, behold, Matthew 17, 5. While he was still speaking, behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them and suddenly a voice came. So it wasn't slow uh, you have to think Peter's there. They've just woken up and he's saying something silly because he's not thinking right. And they he's just witnessed this this transcendent glory of Jesus Christ. And after he says this, this cloud immediately comes over them. And suddenly a voice comes while they're in the cloud. And it says, this is my beloved son, hear him. Um, this cloud is used and God has manifested this uh, form of glory in multiple ways in, in the Old Testament and in other places too. Like uh, some author thought that that was similar to what Paul might have witnessed. But, uh, and then there's that glory that we saw at the birth around the shepherds uh, shown around them, you know. So, <clears throat> but specifically, this cloud reminds of the Shekinah glory in Exodus 40. If you go to Exodus 40, and I know that Noel's already been through there, so I'm just going to remind of it. Exodus 40. Verse 34, then the cloud, uh, the end of verse 33. So men, Moses finished the work. Then the cloud covered the tabernacle of meeting and the glory of the Lord filled the temple. So this is, this glory, I would say, is the same glory. It's the glory of Yahweh. It's the glory of the Lord. And if you go also to 1 Kings 8, First Kings eight, verse ten and eleven, and then I'll move on. And it came to pass when the priest came out of the holy place that the cloud filled the house, so that the priest could not continue ministering because of the cloud. They can't see. They can't. It. it they know that. 
I, can't, I cannot perform the duties and not only can I not physically do it, this glory of God is, is uh, where I cannot be. <laughs> For the glory of the Lord filled the house of the Lord. Then Solomon spoke. So how does Solomon interpret what had happened? The Lord said, he would dwell in the dark cloud. I have surely built you an exalted house, a place for you to dwell in forever. This is God's presence. This is the way in which God is manifesting his presence that he is communicating. I am there. I am dwelling with you. And is, but he's omnipresent, immense. <laughs> how, how is it that, well, there is a particular communication of God's glory that's occurring right here. There's a particular blessedness where God is blessing those that are near and in the cloud. He's, it's a way of communicating, I'm near. And when it's coming around them and the Son, having seen His glory that the Father has revealed to them and then what does the, the father say this is my beloved son look I am drawing near to you this is my beloved son he, a commandment hear him that reminds us of Deuteronomy 18 uh, I will raise up for your prophet him you shall hear and the father is making it so so clear it can't get any more clear this is the one. This is the one who manifests my name. This is the one through whom you will be saved. This is the promised Messiah. This is my anointed. And if you want to know what I am and what I look like, look to him. I have sent him for this purpose. Hear him. That doesn't mean just listen. Like obey what he says. Everything. Hang on every word that he says. It's a very glorious event. Uh, and it's all a, f a foretelling of the glory that Christ has now. And Moses and Elijah are just a foretaste of what will be even greater at the resurrection for all those who put their trust in Christ. And the whole thing from verse 18 and on is heavily stressing the exclusivity of Jesus Christ as the only way of salvation. Uh, he's the only one who's revealed Moses and Elijah are witnessing to him he just got done saying if anyone does not come after me um, the father saying hear him so those things should help uh, equip us to rightly think where should I go to think of the glory of God well think of the glory of God as manifest in the face and work of of Jesus Christ and God through Christ. All right, let's, let's, uh, I want to say a, a, a quick note about the already and not yet. So God is uh, glorified and manifests his glory and that everything is not like chronologically, categorically nice and like the way our finite minds work. I make a list and I got to work down just like I'm teaching. But, but God overlaps his ages. He, he brings in new covenant benefits all the way back in Genesis 3.15. And there's already eternal life being given there and only being more and more manifest and bearing more and more fruit throughout the entire New Testament all the way to the climax or the glorification. But yet all along, there's the old covenant, there's the old world that's passing away and yet still God is working and there's this already of salvation and there's this not yet. So this thing with um, the transfiguration that tells us is that there is a, a not yet aspect of God's glory that he will communicate to us and that we will partake of in communion with him that we ought to be hoping in and setting our eyes upon. I want to be with him in that state. 
I want to be freed in such a way that I might know him without the hindrances that God never intended me to have. So um, let me read this quote. Another redemptive historical expression of God's extrinsic glory, that's the God manifesting what he possesses and describing and declaring it and manifesting it outwardly to others, can be viewed from the vantage point of the already not yet tension. It's interesting. We're saved. We're currently being saved and we will be saved. So there's already aspects and there's not yet aspects. Uh, his glory, that's God's glory, has been seen and is presently being displayed. That is clear from many texts and topics we have already referenced. Creation, human beings created in the image of God, particular manifestations like in the Old Testament, Christ, salvation. Yet history still awaits God's ultimate display of himself. Ortland puts it passionately. His glory will be admired and delighted in and trembled everywhere. Later, he adds, God is moving toward the new heavens and the new earth. He has promised the full display of his glory. And then Beaky, or I'm sorry, not Beaky, Gregory Beale uh, on Revelation. The sovereignty of God and Christ in redeeming and judging brings them glory, which is intended to motivate saints to worship God and reflect his glorious attributes through obedience to his word. Even more, nothing from the old world will be able to hinder God's glorious presence from completely filling the new cosmos, nor hinder the saints from unceasing access to that divine presence. Uh, so this, this uh, manifestation of Christ and thereby the manifestation of the glory of God should point us not just to the present for them or even the present for ourselves, but to the future to come. Uh, Robinson has a question. Yes, Miss Betty asked a question with reference to First King eight, First Kings eight verse twelve, where it talks about the Lord said He would dwell in the dark cloud. So the question is, if it's God's glory, why is it dark and not super bright with reference to the cloud? That's a good point. Um, I don't know. I haven't uh, given much thought to dark versus bright. Uh, what I was focusing on was cloud. Uh, I know that in the redemption of Israel, there was a cloud that led them by day and a cloud that led them by night. And for some, it was terrible. It was judgment. For others, it was deliverance. Uh, so Solomon, seeing this glory filling the temple, uh, knows that God manifests his presence and communicates his dwelling somewhere through the cloud. And I'm thinking to perhaps maybe the dark is re referring to the th maybe the thickness of the cloud, maybe because it was so dense. Um, yeah. Just perhaps that yeah, could that be. might. I don't know. Um, but that's a good question. Well, let's let's go to um, the next point, our last point: God's glory revealed in the second coming of Jesus Christ. And we're going to use Mark and Matthew and Mark. So I've taken the second coming of Christ in the synoptics when it's mentioned. And I focused on Matthew and Mark because they're using this word glory, doxa, with reference to it. And then when I looked at those, those texts, they overlap because they're talking about the second coming of Christ. But they hit different aspects of the second coming, and I tried to break that into three aspects. There's repeated mention of 
the glory of his Father. There's repeated mention of the throne of his glory, and there's repeated mention of what he will do when he comes in his second coming. And we wanted to look at those things because that word doxa is all tied in with that and being glorious. And we want to see what we can learn of God through it. The glory of his father. So let's look at Matthew 16, 27. And uh, because I'm focusing on these aspects and not the harmony of the Gospels, like the chronology, like when Jesus said it in Luke and that same time he said it in Mark, you're going to see me not referencing them together because even though it was the same event that they're both writing about, over here one author is revealing a different aspect of the second coming and then over here an author is revealing a different aspect. So we're going to kind of jump around and you're going to find ourselves right back to where we were, but that's because now we're back over there. We're looking at a different aspect. So that's how I categorized it. If you're kind of confused, like, hey, Mark 838 isn't the same thing that was going over. Why did he? That's why. It's because we're looking at this phrase, the glory of his father. Mark, Matthew 16, 27. For the son of man will come in the glory of his father with his angels. And Mark eight thirty eight. For whoever is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of him the Son of Man will also be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. I, I am not comfortable or real clear on the meaning of this glory, the glory of his Father. And it's tied up into two realities, and I, uh, I want to discuss that. Jesus Christ, there is a sense in which Christ had not received the reward of his sufferings and been exalted as the God-man to the right hand of the Father in, in his ascension and session. That, that, when we consider his humanity and we consider his work of redemption, prior to completing that redemption, those benefits or those rewards uh, were not yet formally given. And <clears throat> yet, despite the work of redemption, Jesus Christ has that's I would call his mediatorial lordship, mediatorial glory. Well, there's also his lordship as the son of God, divine deity, and his glory as being the only begotten of the father. And of course, this one over here is, is inextricably, indispensably dependent upon his onto ontological glory. Um, but they are in two different categories. It does help to make that distinction. Um, the scriptures do that. And I want to show that to you. So when we hear the glory of his father, I don't think that's just the glory that he had before the world was. I think that that's the glory that he had before the world was as well as the reward of his sufferings as being coronated. That means enthroned and crowned God's mediatorial king, given the name above every name and having taken that position in God's redemption, uh, historical redemption. He is God's ontological beloved only begotten son who now having fulfilled his humiliation is exalted and when he comes in the glory of his father it's not only his ontological glory that he had before the world was where he said in John 17 5 glorify 
me with the glory that I had with you before the world was. It's also, I believe, his receiving a kingdom and receiving. Go, let's go to Daniel. Daniel 7. Verse, I'll start at nine. I watched till thrones were put in place and the Ancient of Days was seated. His garment was white as snow and the hair of his head was like pure wool. His throne was a fiery flame, its wheels a burning fire. A fiery stream issued and came forth from before him and thousands a thousand thousands ministered to him. 10,000 times 10,000 stood before him. The court was seated and the books were opened. And go to verse 13. I was watching in the night visions and behold, one like the son of man coming with the clouds of heaven, he came to the ancient of days and they brought him near before him. That's they brought the son of man near before the ancient of days. Then to him, the son of man, that is, was given dominion and glory and a kingdom. That all peoples, nations and languages should serve him. Go to uh, Psalm 110. You see that glory there that was given to him. Psalm 110, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool. The Lord shall send the rod of your strength out of Zion, rule in the midst of your enemies. This sit at my right hand is the session of Christ. He did not enter into his session until after his humiliation. That means he had to perform all the works of obedience and fulfillment of all his prophecies. Die as a substitutionary death and atoning for the people's sins. And then he was resurrected and ascended and was seated. That session is when he says, sit at my right hand. Um, Psalm 2 and I'll, I'll leave it there Psalm 2 why do the nations rage and the people plot a vain thing the kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed saying, let us break their bonds in pieces and cast away their cords from us. He who sits in the heavens shall laugh. The Lord shall hold them in derision and he shall speak to them in his wrath and distress them in his deep displeasure. Yet I have set my king on my holy hill. I will declare the decree. The Lord has said to me, you are my son. Today I have begotten you. Ask of me and I will give you the nations I will give you the nations of your inheritance. And Hebrews picks that up and goes over all these texts about the deity of Christ, but specifically uh, the glory of Christ in his coronation. Him being the, the, the God has spoken through his son. Well, his son, the one whom has resurrected and seated at the right hand of God, he set him on his seat, uh, his throne. So that glory, this glory of his father, I believe, is both ontological and mediatorial. And you remember Philippians 2? In my mind, I'm feeling like some, somebody out there might not be convinced with what they've seen so far. I know when I was first learning of these things, it was kind of like, how oh, does that work? You yeah. know, God is timeless, eternal. And yet these texts are very clear. Um, but there's that already and not yet that goes on too that makes it not easy for us in our own 
capacities to understand these things. But the texts say it. And here's another one, Philippians 2. He came from heaven. He humbled himself. Therefore, God has exalted him and given him the name. He gave him the name. It's, it's, a, it's a lordship and a title that he did not yet have because it's partic particularly related to his mediation. So when, it, when he says, I'm, I'm going to come in the glory of my father, <laughs> he's coming in his divine glory in that sense where it's ontologically he's glorious, but he's coming equipped and set in its appropriate time to carry out the will of his father now as king. Prophet, priest, and king, mediator is coming to judge and to save with great power. The throne of his glory to, to kind of shorten things up here now. Uh, the throne should remind us that Jesus Christ has been set, uh, given a kingdom, as we saw in Daniel. He, it reminds and teaches us something of God's sovereignty. Uh, you know, uh, we live in a democracy, but Jesus Christ sits on his throne and he is king, the king of kings. And when he comes in his glory, everything he wills to be done, it will be done with totalitarian absolute obedience. It, the angels will go forth and slay those who do not know him. And those who know him, they will be saved. No one will snatch them out of his hand. They're, they're going to be transformed into glorification, resurrected and ascent. The, the ones that are in the intermediate state are coming with him. And the ones that are still here on earth, having the ones coming from heaven will receive their bodies. But the ones that are here on earth will be completely glorified and meet the Lord in the air as they come. As God, Christ, comes. So um, God's glory is revealed in the throne of Jesus Christ. And last, his works. So some of the works that Jesus would do is, if you remember, he said, I will send the angels and they will gather the elect. So one of the things that Christ will do when he returns in his second coming is he will consummate his salvation. He will finalize it and he will collect them. And they will all be together with him, glorified. And he will judge. The Bible is even more proliferate on that. He's coming to judge. He will come with great awe and, and terrible judgment for those who do not know him and refuse to believe in him. Um, so those are the... The, the key events that we looked at and we were kind of letting that word doxa kind of guide us to those events. Um, and I, as I step back and think of, of the glory of God and how they're manifested in the in incarnation and the birth and the transfiguration and the second coming, um, I, I know and uh, from other scripture that those are great places for us to be in, looking and seeking to know and grow in the, glor the knowledge of the glory of God. And uh, we saw how that word glory can mean different things. It can be something that God, speaking of his, himself and his own name and attributes, possesses. Or it can be something where God is manifesting outwardly uh, some display of his glory for those who are receiving it to understand. And it can be a verb used to glorify God where we, uh, in partaking in this glory of God, we uh, share in our communion and worship of God. We speak and praise his name for what has been revealed to us in truth. Not that we add to him, but that we make manifest to those around us what is true of him and 
uh, we express our love, adoration, and worship to him as we glorify him. And we looked at it in the birth of Jesus surrounding the, the angels, surrounding the, the uh, incarnation and the, uh, the shepherds, the message that they came to give of Christ. We looked at the transfiguration around the cloud, what God said, Moses and Elijah. And we looked at the second coming. So um, I hope these questions will help you in uh, diving a little bit further in this. If you need help in picking a commentary or a, a, a systematic theology, feel free to text me or ask a brother that you know knows. Um, and may God be honored in your hearts as you have grown through this, Lord willing. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we praise your name and glorify you in your revelation of yourself in Jesus Christ. Uh, we ask that you would help this word that we've looked at not leave our minds so easily like seed that is snatched up by birds but that it would reach the good soil that you've made us to be and have deep roots. Lord, help us uh, in general at this church grow in the knowledge of your glory and the knowledge of you as we study you in these studies. And I pray that our worship this morning would uh, be pleasing in your sight and that your people would apply what they've heard as they let their minds be uh, renewed with this truth as they sing and listen. In Christ's name I pray, amen.